Good afternoon. Thank you for attending um, the Anesthesia Career Trends and Opportunities webinar with Somnia Anesthesia and Gaswork.com. I'd like to direct this presentation to Dr. Martin. Dr. Martin? Hello. I would like to welcome all the attendees to our webinar entitled Anesthesia Careers, Trends and Opportunities. This webinar is a joint presentation between Somnia Anesthesia and Gaswork.com. It's first in a series that attempts to provide useful employment information. So far, the response has been incredible with over 340 registrants. I'm Paul Martin, president and founder of Gaswork.com. 16 years ago, I started Gaswork.com to help anesthesia professionals find jobs. We're always trying to improve, so please send Gaswork.com your suggestions. Thanks. Next slide, please. Today we'll discuss the current anesthesia job market, demand by specialty and geography, compensation trends, what's important to employers today, and a successful interview. At the end of this presentation, you'll have an opportunity to submit your questions with the chat feature. Next slide. We are lucky to have three distinguished anesthesia professionals presenting today. Dr. Robert Farrar, Mr. Brent Summer, and Dr. Frank Schramm. Dr. Farrar joined Somnia as Vice President of Medical Affairs early this year with 25 years experience in clinical anesthesiology. He began his career at Henry Ford Hospital where he was senior staff anesthesiologist in the divisions of cardiothoracic anesthesia and critical care medicine. Prior to joining Somnia, he served as Director of Cardiothoracic Anesthesiology and Vice, Pres Vice Chairman of the Department of Anesthesiology at Lower Bucks Hospital in Bristol, Pennsylvania, and as Chairman of the Department of Anesthesiology at Easton Hospital in Easton, Pennsylvania. Mr. Summer is a seasoned CRNA whose experience encompasses clinical, administrative, and educational aspects of nurse anesthesia practice. He currently practices as staff anesthetist at Desert Regional Medical Center in Palm Springs, California, where Somnia manages the anesthesia department. Dr. Shram has been practicing medicine for 25 years and serves as Chief of Anesthesia at Providence Regional Medical Center in Everett, Washington, where the anesthesia department is also managed by Somnia. He is board certified in both internal medicine and anesthesiology with 20 years in private practice, seven as a managing partner, prior to becoming Chief of Anesthesia at Providence Regional Medical Center. Next slide. We'll start with Dr. Ferrer's talk on anesthesia job market. Thank you, Paul, and welcome, everybody. You know, there was a tremendous interest in today's webinar, and we're pleased that our audience includes a number of early clinicians who are just starting out in their career, as well as many seasoned practitioners as well. I'd also like to add that even though I'm a member of the executive team at Somnia, I'm still a practicing clinical anesthesiologist, and my specialty training is in cardiothoracic anesthesia, and I have additional boards in critical care medicine. Uh, next slide, please. Um, our specialty has seen some dramatic changes in the past three decades, and this is a real exciting time to be an anesthesia care provider. There are so many innovations that have occurred in, my, in the course of my career alone, and the best is, is yet to come. We have led the medical field in areas of quality metrics and patient safety and technical innovation. And, and, and on this really rather simplistic slide, I tried to illustrate some things that came to mind as I was putting together this discussion. Now, I'm in my mid-50s, and I can remember a time when almost all surgery was done in the hospital, and when we uh, gave anesthesia by dialing in a copper kettle for a dose of halothane. What we've seen in the past few decades is the growth of the surgery centers and expansion of doing procedures in the patients and uh, providers' offices. For example, during my residency, I can remember that a cholecystectomy was a major intra-abdominal procedure and committed you to a three- to five-day hospital stay and almost three to four weeks out of work. Now it's an outpatient procedure and you're back at work in days. As far as the baby boomers, you're going to hear about that throughout this entire presentation because it is a force to be reckoned with. Similarly, the technological innovations that we have has been legion in the field of medicine. Uh, end tidal CO2, again, I can remember during my residency when we measured end tidal CO2 and confirmed endotracheal tube placement with a mass spectrometer. And if you're lucky, it would take less than five minutes to cycle to get one reading. Pulse oximetry has changed the landscape of anesthesia and critical care medicine. Point of service labs where you can now get a blood gas in, in the same room that you're doing your heart surgery. 
transesophageal echocardiography has changed uh, our, our impact and our influence in cardiac anesthesia and cardiac surgery. And GlideScope sometimes makes even the most difficult intubation seem routine. Next slide, please. For those of us that were in practice in the 1990s, you'll recall that reports came out at that time predicting an oversupply of anesthesiologists into about 2010. It was those reports that scared people, and as a consequence of those reports, there were a few jobs, and those that were available were rather poorly paying because there was this perception of oversupply. Well, this, this corrected in the late 90s and early 2000s when the true impact of anesthesia care was appreciated and the demand was revealed. You know, at that time, there was an increasing use of anesthesia for interventional procedures, more complicated procedures, regular use of anesthesia for GI, office-based procedures, and again, the aging of the baby, baby boomers. That's revealing in reality that there was a, a really supply and demand disparity. Um, on this next slide, we could see that, that what today's reality is. There's a shortage of anesthesiologists as well as CRNAs nationwide. There's a decrease in the supply of anesthesiologists due to a number of different factors. And as regards in relation to CRNAs, in some areas we have a slightly greater supply exceeding the demand, but in other areas the supply is truly insufficient for the demand. But then again, there's opportunities out there for everyone. Next slide, please. Some of the consequences of our dis supply demand disparity are, are clear to all of us that are in the active practicing field. And the shortage of providers has caused some hospitals to either close their ORs or reduce, or, or reduce OR, OR hours, consolidate care to try to address the need for the decrease or the, the demand for uh, anesthesia providers. This prediction is extended through to about 2020, where it's clear that the MD demand will continue to outpace the projected supply. CRNA supply will continue to outpace current demand in some of our markets. The anesthesia residency positions are filled in 2012. Almost 100% of the anesthesia residency positions were filled. And as you can tell, these are shortage of providers are on a local level are very real. At Somnia, we have a rigorous recruiting process and we're always looking for good people. In evaluating prospective candidates, we hire with an eye towards retention and a long-term relationship. Next slide. This graph reflects an opening, the openings as reported on gas work. Note that there are some seasonal variations and somewhat of a seesaw distribution of the CRNA positions. It's important to note that this is a gas work graph, and while it does show an upward trend, it doesn't reflect all the jobs necessarily that are available in the market. Many jobs are still word of mouth and through personal, net, personal and professional networking. Next slide, please. Over here, the demand by specialty and geography. Next slide. Finding an opportunity in a universally desirable area can sometimes prove challenging. And we'll address networking to optimize finding the right opportunity in an area which suits you a little further into the presentation. But if you look at the five top states, and by the way, this is Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, 2011, the top five states are California, Florida, Illinois, Texas, and New York. So I guess the take home message here is if you're looking for a job in New York City or San Francisco, Chicago, Miami, or Dallas, you might have a little bit more a challenging, uh, challenging time than if you were to try to find it in Detroit or Cleveland or some other area. Next slide. Some of the top states for anesthesiologists and CRNA demand uh, is based on gas work data uh, from September of 2012. So this is just a month old, and again, it's from gas work data. And one of the interesting findings is, is that if you can recall from the previous slide, New York is in the top five states with the highest concentration of anesthesia providers, yet it's still in the top 10 for demand of anesthesia providers. Now, much of that is driven by the large number of providers in the metropolitan areas of the state, while the need for providers in upstate and rural New York is still really pretty high. Again, remember, this is, this is gas work data, and it's one element that is just uh, in part of our uh, measurement of job, uh, job demand. Next slide, please. Here we go. Okay. In, in this breakdown of demand by specialty, again, the data here is from gas work ads, we can see that the demand for anesthesiologists and CRNA is, is fairly evenly matched with several exceptions. Specifically in the areas of pain and 
cardiac, thoracic, major vascular, and obviously critical care medicine is more the demand for the anesthesiologists, whereas the demand for the CRNAs is a little bit more in the outpatient ortho, ortho areas. It's also worth noting that as opt-out uh, opt out provisions are occur in many of the states, this may drive the, the increase in CRNAs in some areas. Okay, compensation trends, the bucks. This is what a lot of people are, want to hear about. Uh, anesthesiologist salaries are among the best. Okay, uh, if you look here, this is from cnnmoney.com. Anesthesiologists and CRNAs are among the top earners in the medical and nursing profession with uh, median pay of about 290000 for the anesthesiologist and about 156 for the CRNA. Now, it's important to recognize that clinician salaries are going to be influenced by a multitude of factors. Some of the questions that are going to be raised are, are you in private practice? Are you in academic practice? Are you in group practice? Are you solo? Where is it you want to practice? You're, you're, you're likely to make more in rural Tennessee where the demand is high than in New York City where there's a higher population density of anesthesiologists. Additionally, what is it that you bring to the table? Are you cardiac, ICU, do you have TEE skills? Is there anything special that you can market for yourself? Or are you a generalist? Do you take call? Are you full-time? Are you part-time? Do you have benefits? Are you an independent contractor? So a number of these factors go into determining what your net salary is going to be. Now, on this next slide, what we see is that uh, in order to describe how diverse the market is, we've listed anesthesia salaries from a number of different sources. And some of these sources include the Economic Research Institute, Medscape, as well as Gaswork. And if you look here, you'll see that the average salary for an anesthesiologist with five years of experience is about $265,000, with ranges in academics going from 220 up to multi-specialty group practices of almost 400000 Now, on Gaswork, as of October 11th, just a few weeks ago, the average salary for anesthesiologist positions was about $307,000, $306,486. The average for a CRNA with five years experience is $148,000. Um, so this is, this is a composite of about 210 CRNA jobs. Um, and what's important to remember that this is an average, and this includes both full-time and part-time and those who take call and those who don't. So these are average salaries that we're taking home here. Now, at Somnia, when we determine salary for any particular opportunity, we consider a number of other various data points and from other leading sources, including Sullivan Cotter, William Mercer, and Watson Wyatt. On this next slide, what we see is the, uh, the variation in salaries by region. And uh, this might be a little bit confusing, but let me see if I can clarify this. If we use 306000 as the average salary from gas work, the numbers in red represent the variance from that mean. So in other words, in South Central United States, Texas, Oklahoma, in those areas, you're going to be making more than the 306, whereas like the Northeast, it's a wash, and in areas such as the West Coast, California, you're going to be making like 7.5% less than the mean of 306,000. Uh, next slide, okay, good. Um, and this, is, this slide here is just to reemphasize that, that not all opportunities or dollars are created equal. What you, really need to peel, what you really need to do is peel back the onion, drill down and examine what is very specifically that you're being offered in any employment opportunity. One thing that I was thinking about that wasn't mentioned on this slide is what kind of malpractice does the group offer? Is the retail? If you leave, who pays for the tail? The bottom line for all of this is if you're good and you can interact with people well, you should do okay. The last slide here, just going into our directions, where, where are we going? Uh, and as I promised, here it is again. I'm going to mention the baby boomers since I'm one of them. We are going to be driving the need for surgical and medical services. Moreover, our nation's baby boomer clinicians are either at or near retirement as well. And this is going to continue to grow the need for qualified anesthesia pra pra practitioners and providers. Uh, it, it's not Kansas anymore, Dorothy. There's, there's new metrics that we must, address our and we must address in our practices. There's a growing emphasis on value and quality, uh, and just being good is no longer good enough. The key points I'd like to leave you with before I turn this over to Dr. Shramar, number one, this is an exciting time in our specialty. 
As anesthesia providers, we lead the way in innovation, not only technologically driven medical practice, but in quality metrics and patient safety as well. This field is wide open for opportunities throughout the United States, and the opportunities will measurably be available through the end of the decade. All of us here at SAMI look forward to being of further assistance and to getting to know many of you in the future and participate in your career choice and decisions. Frank, I'd like to turn this over to you. Thanks, Bob. Hello, my name is Frank Sam. I'm the Chief of Anesthesia Services at Providence Regional Medical Center in Everett, Washington, a Somnia site. I, take a modicum, I have a modicum of experience with interviewing and hiring applicants for anesthesia positions. And I'll be speaking to you about topical issues which are important to prospective employers in today's marketplace. Next slide, please. Employers seek attributes that um, include flexibility and openness to new ideas, evidence that you're serious about providing excellent patient care, and a strong commitment to quality assurance and improvement, both personal and departmental. We're all familiar with the old anesthesia aphorism of the three A's. The three A's, of course, are ability, availability, and affability, not necessarily in that order. There's a new paradigm. As Dr. Farrar mentioned, it's not good enough to just show up and give an anesthetic anymore. It's important to understand that I believe that there are now four A's. The first three remain the same, ability, availability, and affability. The fourth is accountability, and it references the commitment of the provider to the delivery of high quality, indicated, cost efficient, and effective timely care. So an employer is going to be assessing your ability to deliver that when they interview you. That's one of the things that they're looking for. Quality matters to prospective employers because compensation by Medicare to hospitals is influenced by the achievement of certain metrics. Next slide, please. As we see here, the acronym P for P, or pay for performance, is a metric. Please go back one slide. There you go. Is a metric uh, that was in place uh, for the last several years. It's typically defined by the quantity of care delivered and the efficiency of the process associated with that care. SKIP is an example of this, the Surgical Care Improvement Project, which addresses the provision of prophylactic antibiotics in a timely fashion, the use of beta blockers in surgical patients, DVT prophylaxis, and cardiac patient glucose control. Those were all measures that were um, either attained or not attained uh, and scored based on performance. We also have moved into the realm of pay for outcome, which is kind of a natural evolution of pay for performance. In general, pay for outcomes is results and quality oriented. The results are objective, the quality is often subjective. The two CMS administered programs which are being used currently to measure these include value-based purchasing, or VBP, and HCAPs, or Hospital Consumer Assessment of Healthcare Providers. The first VBP survey was done in 2006, and subsequently the results were released in 2008. A combination of VBP and HCAPs is being used now to attribute payment to patients or to hospitals for the care of patients by Medicare. There may either be a net profit or a net loss depending on the hospital and provider's ability to meet the goals of pay for outcome. Watchwords for pay for outcome include accountability, transparency, and monetary incentives. These measures can be observed on websites such as hospitalcompare.gov. It's very important to not underestimate the significance to the employer slash stakeholder as withhold amounts may increase up to 10% in the near future. Healthcare reform's impact on anesthesia is something that's been prevalent in the news lately. We're all familiar with PPACA, or the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, i.e. Obamacare. The impact that this will have on anesthesia is largely unknown at this point in time, and a lot hinges on the outcome of the upcoming election. However, we can look at it and we can say that historically, we addressed 
anesthesia care in terms of qualitative or anecdotal metrics, which are no longer valid. They are important, but they are not the sole metric used to assess the quality of care delivered. We're now into the realm of quantifiable metrics, and potential employers are interested in your understanding of these metrics. We're talking about outcome indicators, using local comparators against national benchmarks from organizations such as NACOR and AQI, looking at metrics such as post-operative nausea and vomiting rates, PACU length of stay, hospital length of stay, case mix index. These are all very important things to your employer and to the hospital. And your ability to understand and be conversant on these topics will make you an attractive hire. Anesthesia quality assurance and performance improvements, very important. The ability to actually evaluate one's own practice against national benchmarks is imperative. The measurement of patient satisfaction and surgeon satisfaction are carried out through surveys, and they're part of the HCAP measures that I mentioned before. They're also incredibly important. And so your willingness and ability to participate in those kinds of metrics is an important message to give to your potential employer, because they're looking for that. The ability to lower the cost of care is also a metric that's important. All of these things get put together and synthesized into a performance outcome cost profile for a provider. You can expect that in the near future, these are the kinds of things that people will be talking about when they talk about an anesthesia provider. What's his profile like? Does he provide high quality care at a low cost? So it's important to prospective employers because they need your help to achieve these goals. This is our opportunity, in my opinion, to demonstrate our value to the hospital and other players that may not have been aware of it in the past. Next slide, please. Your prospective employer may ask you, how can you impact anesthesia quality? Be prepared to discuss and demonstrate your qualifications to become a valued member of the anesthesia care team. There's an expectation of willingness to participate in projects, initiatives, committees, and to facilitate department and interdisciplinary training and education. Expect to be questioned about your commitment to compliance and understand the CMS conditions of participation as they apply to the practice of anesthesia. Also be aware of and familiar with the ASA and AANA practice standards and guidelines, because these will be important to your potential employer as well. Be ready to voice your understanding of the need to produce quantifiable quality outcomes, and expect to be asked about your willingness to utilize tools, such as the surveys I mentioned before, to track, report, monitor, and improve clinical events and outcomes at the prospective facility while maintaining the highest levels of compliance with value-based purchasing. Embrace the validation of services through customer satisfaction surveys and expect a candid discussion regarding your openness to the concept of continuous self-improvement. Try to keep current on anesthesia information management modalities and electronic medical records, as these will also be important um, attributes to a potential employer. Next slide, please. Be familiar with the most common group practice and individual clinician validation resources. The organization you are preparing to join should participate with the Anesthesia Quality Institute or other organizations to benchmark clinical outcomes against nationally reported outcomes. Be aware that the MGMA practice productivity data can be used as a benchmark of your group's practice and individual clinician productivity and financials, and be prepared to discuss this with your potential employer. Be open to the use of patient and certain satisfaction surveys to continuously validate group practice and individual clinician satisfaction and man maintain an open-minded attitude regarding accreditation by the Joint Commission and the compliance audits, audits that are necessary to maintain continuous levels of survey readiness. Look for the use of these metrics in the practices of future employers and understand that your participation is imperative to your and your future practices success. These are a few of the attributes possessed by a high-quality candidate and are an expectation of employers moving into the future.
Thank you. I'd like to turn it over now to Brent Sumner. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining our program today. I'd like to remind everyone that following my presentation, we'll have a time for questions and answers. So I'd ask that if you do have questions, begin to um, ask them by um, asking them through the chat panel on your web browser dashboard. Thank you. First slide. There's an increasing uh, opportunity for folks to find positions um, by using social media. We've seen that this instance of using the social media has almost tripled throughout the last decade, and particularly in the last couple of years, it's starting to be on the rise. Other ways in which we can um, have you search for positions is through other social media sites, including LinkedIn, Facebook, and Gaswork, for example. Nothing can be said too much about networking. Many people find that it's the top lead source that they use in securing and researching positions that might be available. Some other advice I can offer is that you join and become active in your national, state, and local professional and uh, organizations and associations. By attending various symposia, workshops, and conferences, you can also network and make some strong leads that will lead you to a potential position in the future. Next slide, please. Before you do have your interview, I suggest that you do your homework. Have the strongest understanding of the facility and the people that you'll be meeting with prior to your actual interview appointment. You can review the facility on the web by looking at their website and any research that pertains to their various organization by having a clear understandings of the service it offers as well as the corporate culture that you might be entering. Research those who you may be meeting with, the interviewers, to identify ways in which you might be able to connect throughout the interview. Identify any previous connections that you may have had through either medical or nursing school, as some alumni may be connected with the organization or even be on staff. Try to identify any keywords or themes that you might find in their website and be able to express, express that through any uh, or conversations that you might have with the various players with whom you may meet. Have pressed questions prepared that you might be asking the people that will be interviewing you. And be sure that any supportive documents that you are offering are current and concise. It's also a real good idea to identify and contact any references that you will be offering at the time of the interview or application. Next slide, please. Ways in which you can prepare for the most successful interview is to be able to articulate why you felt or you feel that you're a good fit for the position. How does your skill set, your personal and professional strengths, and any accomplishments that you've met relate to the position that you're applying for? It's a good idea to have a 60-second response to the question of, tell me about yourself, or walk me through your CV. Have an idea of four or five strong points that you want to stress when you're explaining to people who you are and what you're about. Anticipate any questions that may be asked as well about your past experience or your career goals. It's a good idea to have an idea where you might want to be, say, five or ten years from now, particularly if you're with the organization that you're applying to. If you're shy, practice interviewing in front of a mirror with a colleague or a friend or a partner. Always be ready as well to discuss any areas that you would like to improve upon, what you find challenging, and how you would like to expand your practice in the future. Business professional is always a good way to go in terms of dress and presentation at the interview. Next slide, please. During the interview, listen and demonstrate that you have an understanding of the questions being asked. Provide ex specific examples in order to support your answers, in order to make it clear. Ask cogent questions such as what the staffing model might look like. What is the organization's mission, vision, and values? What does the case volume entail? And what's the level of acuity of their patient population? And what can you expect in terms of mentoring or proctoring process once you do join the team? 
These questions can help you decide if the role will fulfill what you're looking for, both on a personal and professional level, as well as in the future. It's a good idea to express your sincere interest in the position and the facility before you depart the interview. Be timely and responsive in all of your follow-up correspondence with the people you meet, particularly those who will be making the decisions. And remember, no one expects you to be an expert in the interview. Be humble, be honest and concise, and open-ended. Next slide, please. Some tips for clinical evaluation that I can offer is that you want to have conversations with as many people as possible within the practice setting, the chief of service, the medical director, and other managers who may influence the hiring or be interested in what your clinical skill set might look like to determine if you're a good fit for the team. Have some hypothetical questions or clinical situations in mind that might be asked. You'll, they'll be evaluating your interpersonal skills as well. Try to meet members of the perioperative team and other persons who might be involved in the workplace. And remember that OR, ORs are not always the most optimal place for an interview to occur. It might happen in a more public place like a, a lounge or a break room. So try to be most flexible and cooperative during the interview and offer your uh, opinion about what you might be able to do to improve your organization once you join it. Next slide, please. At Somnia, we've developed a list of 10 or more qualities that we feel make an effective anesthesia provider. I'd like to go through a few of those qualities now. We're looking for someone who's clinically adept has a strong work ethic, maintains strong interpersonal skills in a solid and comforting bedside manner. A team player, someone who is a clear communicator and has high ethical standards. Someone who consistently uses good judgment, has a personality and a presence that's accessible, flexible, and responsive to the need of the organization as well as the workplace. Next slide, please. In summary, I'd like to say that although there's a, it's a competitive market, there's an opportunity that exists for just about everyone. Be solid, if, be solid in your preparation, and you'll have a strong competitive edge. And I can't say enough about networking. As Dr. Schramm mentioned, a demonstration to commitment and quality assurance is certainly key in this day and age, and something that you want to keep as a priority. My own experience has been such that some of the strongest relationships and team situations that I've been able to be involved in over my career have led to many opportunities, not only for myself, but for colleagues and friends throughout the country. And I advise you to visit our websites as much as possible and frequently as our information changes day to day. And please feel free to contact us at any time for further questions inquiries or uh, concerns that you might have regarding what we have to offer. And in the spirit of team membership and partnership, I'd like to turn it back to Dr. Martin for our Q&A. Thank you for listening. Well, thank you, Rent, for that uh, enlightening presentation, and also Dr. Farrar and Dr. Saram. Now we're, our presenters have a few minutes for questions. You can submit your questions using the chat feature. We'll start off with Dr. Farrar. Um, the question says, if I'm committed to a particular geographic area, what should my strategy be? Dr. Farrar? Okay, thank you, Paul. Um, th this actually gets into a, a series of value questions. Um, and different people have different motivations for different areas and different types of practices. Some people are motivated by money. Some people are motivated by the practice opportunity. Some people are motivated by geography, uh, benefits, time off. So in, in the evaluation of any position, the, the very first question you need to ask yourself is, wh what do I really want? What is my motive, motivating factor? For the question you provided me, I'm committed to a particular geographic area. What should my strategy be? If that is the motivating feature, then everything else needs to be put in perspective and given a rank priority. 
Um, if, if I'm committed to, for example, being in the New York, uh, the, 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 excuse me, the New York metropolitan area, how important is money to me? How close do I have to be to the geographic area? Um, do I need to be in New York City itself or would New Jersey or Connecticut in a commutable distance be okay? Am I willing to take call? What special skills do I have? How important is money to me? How important is time off? So a number of different factors have to be uh, part of the metric when you're making that decision. So uh, what should your strategy be? Again, determine what's important to you uh, and uh, try to weight order uh, the different factors for the job. I guess that's the simple version. Okay, well that sounds good, Dr. Farrar. Now we have a question for Dr. Shram. Dr. Shram, what are the top three things I should be conversing in? Well, I think that uh, in terms of my presentation, which was mostly about uh, quality uh, and anesthesia care, the three quality topics that I would recommend uh, would be to make sure you understand the balance between outcomes and process uh, in anesthesia care. Also understand the validation of the anesthesia specific severity of illnesses as uh, an index of performance and outcome because that's going to in the future play a very important role in compensation for care. Also I think it's important to understand um, that uh, the overall process of quality assurance involves the commitment to open disclosure uh, regarding outcomes and associated processes. Be familiar with the NACOR, the National Anesthesia Clinical Outcomes Registry, and the Anesthesia Quality Institute, and the benchmarks that are being formulated at this point in time. A good resource for uh, quality topics uh, that's a fairly easy read is uh, Performance Measurement at a Tipping Point uh, by Glantz and Newman. Uh, from April of 2011 in anesthesia and analgesia. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Shram. Next, uh, the question is for Brent uh, Summer. Uh, Brent, what opportunities uh, are available beyond regular staff positions? Uh, yes, it it's organizational dependent, of course. Um, many um, organizations do um, post positions for more leadership positions, including managers, supervisors, and chief CRNAs, as well as chief of service, um, clinical directors, and various other physician positions. Um, they're not always separated. It depends on which site you're visiting. They're not always separated. But if you can do a search on the site under those headings, some of which I mentioned, we can certainly, uh, you can certainly do a track back to that. You can also send an, an email directly to the recruitment departments at various organizations like ours and uh, inquire that way. Okay, well that sounds good. Um, the, the chat is, feature is, is available for anyone to ask uh, questions. Just type in your questions. Uh, the presenters will be here for a few more minutes. Um, Paul, I just saw a question on, there was a question that uh, was posed about critical care medicine and its um, market draw in private practice. And in, in response to that question, you know, having boards in critical care, when I was at Henry Ford Hospital, I was part of the surgical critical care team. That was a different type of situation. That was a thousand bed hospital with multiple residencies and uh, 900 staff physicians, so it was, that was a little bit different type of environment. We had an anesthesia residency as well, which needed to have critical care anesthesiologists as part of the part of the mix. In terms of private practice, there's really no easy answer for that. So the the individual that asked that question, I'll just say that you really, if you really want to practice critical care medicine as an anesthesia uh, provider. You really need to check out the demographics of the area that you're interested in. Again, what are your priorities? Are you willing to do full-time critical care? You want to do part critical care, part anesthesia? You want to do the bulk of anesthesia with a little bit of critical care thrown in? It depends on who runs the intensive care units in your hospital. Is anesthesia the one that runs it? Is it surgical uh, trauma people that run it? Is it pulmonologist? Is it a combination of internal medicine and, and pulmonology? Uh, again, there's no real easy answer to that question. Again, it depends. Now, your first question is, where do you want to be? What are your goals? And uh, 
it, it depends on what your anesthesia group is. Some anesthesia groups have no interest at all in doing that. Some anesthesia groups are fractured. Some cover OB exclusively. Some cover the general OR exclusively. Some cover cardiac. Some of the larger groups do composites of all those things. They, they cover everything. So it depends on, on where you want to be, what your practice priorities are, and uh, how important uh, practicing critical care is to you. And then you have to really determine each hospital, uh, each facility on a case-by-case -case basis. More likely than not, you should have a fairly reasonably uh, easy time, I use those words kind of cautiously, of an academic or large multi-specialty uh, institution finding a position there uh, as a critical care anesthesiologist. Um, let's see, one, okay, I'll throw in one other question that came through. Um, it was, uh, is it appropriate in terms of etiquette to use an email uh, for your post-interview or is a written letter still the best mode? Um, I'll jump in and I'd, I'll appreciate some feedback from my uh, colleagues on the panel as well as you, Paul. Um, I think email is, is totally appropriate to use. Uh, the days of, you know, stamping a, uh, uh, writing a, a long letter and stamping it and putting it in the mail, it, it may be a week before it gets to someone where the instantaneous aspect of the email acknowledges the fact that you are respectful of the time they've given you, you've, uh, you acknowledged it, you've thanked them for that. And I think email is probably more the accepted way of doing it these days. And I'll, I'll accept some uh, guidance from my colleagues on the panel. This is Frank Schramm, and I completely agree with you. I would. Uh, uh, this is uh, uh, an email is is perfectly appropriate, and uh, I actually prefer it because it allows me to maintain uh, a copy <laughs> without the uh, bother of paper. Uh, Brent, do you have some more uh, advice? Yeah, I'd like to add to that as well. You know, when you're doing your search. Um, first of all, email is the way people are going, so I concur that that's, that's perfectly appropriate. But when you're doing your search, you might offer, not only through communication, but in your, during your face-to-face -face interview, that if you have an interest in a particular um, aspect of practice, like critical care or management and administration, be sure to offer that to the person and tell them you would be interested as well. There's too, too often people miss an opportunity to be able to get that referral from the person they're actually interviewing with. So, for example, if they don't have a position for you, they might be happy to pass it on to a colleague who may. We, we have another question. Th thanks, thanks, Brent and Frank. We have another question, um, and they, they just came in. It says, my anticipated graduation date is May 2013. When is a good time to start applying for jobs? Um, yesterday. Um, th this is a dynamic market. If you're if you're ready to start in 2000 May 2013, that's five 2013. Um, it's a good idea to start going through the field now. Um, try to figure out again. Use the different metrics that I mentioned earlier. Where do you want to be? What are your priorities? And as you start to go through the different employers, you're going to find out. Um, who is the guy? Who are the guys that are that are honorable in the field? And not every single employer out there is an honorable uh, honorable person. Um, uh, you may want to look at um, uh, places like Somnia, for example. Like Somnia is a, a great place to we we encourage. We try to help grow people's careers. We're looking for long-term relationships with people. Um, look at Gaswork. Uh, take a look at a number of different opportunities. But the bottom line is that. Of 10 opportunities that you are going to look at, uh, you're probably going to get interviews at about three or four. Of the three or four, one or two is probably going to be reasonable. And that may not even be the one that suits you. You may have to go on 15 interviews or so to find the one place that you really find that suits you best. Uh, also, I just want to mention that uh, you know the, the the job that you're getting right now may not, may not be the job you retire in you know 30 40 years from now uh, just remember that this is a this is not Kansas anymore Dorothy um, this is not the day when uh, you know you, you, you get your job at uh, you know 27 to 30 years old and you're going to stay in there for the next 35 years and retire with a gold watch it's not like that anymore this is a very fluid and dynamic industry 
Uh, as anesthesia providers, we also have the flexibility of being very portable. Uh, not, that's not to say you don't establish relationships where, where you might be at, but again, we're fairly portable in terms of our ability to go from one place to the next. Uh, one last factor is that wherever you go, wherever you wind up at, and when you find that perfect job for yourself, just remember that it takes anywhere from, you know, six weeks to 12 weeks to get privileges. So if you find your job by early January, you start doing your privileges, it may take you several months to be able to get that to be ready for your May 2013 graduation date. So get started now. Okay. Okay, um, we have a question for Brent. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the question for Brent is, if someone is committed to working in a certain geographic area and isn't currently working there, and there are rarely positions posted for that area, what do you believe would be the most effective way of networking to get into that area? That's a good question. I think an excellent way to begin is through electronic communication. Um, contact your professional organization, whether it be the state, nurse anesthetist, or physician anesthesiologist society, and maybe even attend their next conference get on their mailing list, and um, peruse websites, not only for large organizations, uh, like a large HMOs, hospital organizations, or our own, for example. Um, and that it's inevitably, that way, you'll be able to get some network and at least start a dialogue with someone in the organization who may be able to pass your information on to their colleagues more locally. OK, well, that was the last question. So we'll, we'll go ahead and uh, wrap it up here. Thanks to everyone who participated today, especially Dr. Farrar, Dr. Shram, and Mr. Summer. A recording of this presentation will soon be available on gaswork.com and somniainc.com slash careers. This is the first webinar sponsored by Gaswork and Somnia, and information about future webinars in this series will be forthcoming. In the meantime, we encourage you to utilize all the features of Gaswork and contact the recruitment team at Somnia for information about career opportunities in our national network. Some additional resources appear on this slide. Thank you again, and have a good evening.